Hey there folks, Bob Yeager here, National Chief of the Woodcraft League of America, and I wanted to do a special presentation for you guys because I know a lot of people have been asking about the training that we're going to be bringing out in the Woodcraft League, whether it's offline or online, um, and I wanted to give you a taste of that, and I think this actually, this one presentation here would actually help you kickstart practicing these skills and getting a feel for what the Woodcraft League of America is all about. Um, I want to give special thanks to David Westcott. Uh, he wrote the outline for the original Master Woodsman's training. And throughout the four-part Master Woodsman training series, there are going to be some you know, additions that I'm adding to it and things like that. But uh, he did give me permission to use it as the core kind of outline for one of the trainings within the Woodcraft League of America. So I really do appreciate that. You guys have to realize I started this idea back in about 2013 or so. And... Um, then I came out with One Foot in the Wild and America's Woodsman, and then I started moving into developing the Woodcraft League of America. The idea came out in 2020 to, to reignite the Woodcraft League in a different way than Seton did, um, but many similarities. Um, and then in 2021, I finally just pulled the trigger and said, let's go for it. Well, within all that time, I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of, got a lot of guidance and mentoring and um, had people really put their insights, people that I knew that this, this program, the Woodcraft League and the movement of, the, of Woodcraft was really important to them. And they spent their entire careers practicing and studying these philosophies and skills. Now, um, the first initial conversation I had with David Westcott about it, he said, you know, um, what's it all about? And I said, the way I, he said, what do you think woodcraft is? I said, to me, it's camping with skill and purpose. And he loved it. He said, that's perfect. And purpose meaning your purpose, the reason you go out there, um, what are your intentions? And it could be just to enjoy your time in the wilderness in a safe and fun way and productive way. Um, it could be that you have a group of friends that are in a band and you'd like to do something other than just sit around in the garage playing music all the time with them. And you want to learn some skills together and do something together and give a sense of purpose to that. Um, it could be that you're really into conservation and you want to get a, a, a participate more with nature instead of just observing it. We're from nature. We should be participants, right? It could be many different things. So... But in order to do that, in order to enjoy yourself camping out there with purpose, you have to have the skills to go along with it. And a while back, David wrote a book called Camping in the Old Style. I don't make any money from um, telling you guys this, but go to Amazon, look up Camping in the Old Style by Dev David Westcott and order that book. It is beautifully printed. It's a gorgeous hardback book. It's the way books should be done. And it's this historical exploration of camping and the the vintage styles of camping throughout the ages and the the golden age of camping and I think it was just so masterfully done it's one of my favorite books I've read it over and over and over I can't I, I love just leafing through the pages and looking at the pictures and reading that book um, but it was in the back of that book that I found the outline for the master woodsman training and I had this idea that, well, that's a great core outline for one of the trainings I want to introduce in the Woodcraft League. And what I'm going to do for every one of these sections, there's either going to be within the Woodcraft League membership area when I release it, there's going to be a video and or downloadable supplemental materials um, to help further these skills. For folks. But today I'm going to give you this presentation. I'm going to go through the part one of four in the Master Woodsman training, and that is called the Apprentice Camper. Now, just so you guys know, a lot of you, I know that watch my videos are really skilled woodsmen and outdoorsmen, but I gotta tell you, I went through this first part of this training myself and I journaled it, and I must have filled in like five or six legal pads. I have a binder, that's my journal with legal pads in it. I must have filled up five or six of those, just taking notes of certain things that I wanted to learn or experience or that I observed or that I needed more practice at. And I really enjoyed that process. And 
I think it's really important that we all go back to our fundamentals. We all go back to basics and we start being on purpose, on purpose with the way that we plan our trips and we go out there and we have an enjoyable time in the wilderness. And I think a lot of times we're like, oh, let's just fill that backpack lightweight. Let's get out there and let's get moving on it. And then there's, there's times that we're not practicing the fundamental core values and skills of American woodcraft, of camping, all right? Within the realm of woodcraft is firecraft, toolcraft, ropecraft, nature and conservation, gear and clothing, shelter and bedding, campsite, health and safety, navigation, travel, and food. And we'll get further into the wood working, green wood working element of woodcraft and nature craft and skills um, like camp crafts further into the program but for right now let's talk about these core fundamentals firecraft toolcraft ropecraft nature and conservation gear and clothing shelter and bedding campsite health and safety navigation and travel and food these are the fundamental points of each camping outing that we go on when we prepare for it when we're going on it when we're doing it and when we're coming back and we take note of maybe what we missed maybe what we didn't like what we didn't need Right, And it helps us keep ourselves accountable for everything that we do. Now, what I want you to realize is, is throughout the Master Woodsman's training, and I'm just releasing this part one on, you know, in public like this, outside of the Woodcraft League membership area. Um, each section of the Master Woodsman training, part one through four, will have each of these elements integrated. And you'll, you'll feel compelled to circle back to the previous parts of this training to revisit the skills because they're integrated throughout along the way. That way you're constantly revisiting. Um, it takes a lot to get to that master woodsman status and I don't think that ever ends. I think that's a journey for the rest of our lives. And the more we know, the less we end up caring. <laughs> and the more we know, the less we end up uh, creating extra work for ourselves or extra dangers and risks for ourselves. So let's get right into it. Firecraft. You know, I think that everybody loves to make that campfire. Um, they love to sit around the campfire and talk with friends. And I think a lot of folks overdo it. <laughs> but when it comes down to firecraft, we don't just think about a big giant campfire. We have to learn to select and prepare a fire site for heat, light, cooking, and companionship. Okay? And sometimes those fire lays can be different. So we want to also choose to learn choose and learn to operate and care for a wood fired camp stove. I have many wood fired camp stoves. Um, foldable little pack stoves, bigger stoves um, that use wood. Now it took me a while to figure out which one I liked for me the best. And quite honestly, it's one of my homemade ones I like for me the best. And that's why within the Woodcraft League, through our campcraft section, we're going to be actually building a camp stove, um, a cooking stove, right? But choose and learn to operate and care for a wood-fired camp stove. Learn how to light, utilize, and extinguish various fuels. A lot of folks think that in Woodcraft, all we do is grab stuff from nature and that's what we light our fires with. Not always. When we're camping, we do want to collect resources and things, but we also like to bring various fuels with us just in case one thing doesn't work out. Um, we're in different situations. Um, in a wood-fired camp stove, you might use a piece of fat wood that you brought with you that you bought at the hardware store because there's none in your area. Who knows, right? You might use some kind of tinder quick. You might use an esbit little uh, fuel cell. There's different things that you might use, but you need to learn how to light, utilize, and extinguish various fuels because we're not always going to be using the same fuels all the time. And somebody asked me not too long ago, what, you know, what makes the difference if we have a common fuel that we like to use all the time, wh why change it? Well, because two is one and one is none. Some fuels won't work in certain weather, certain climates, certain environments, or you won't be able to use it in the certain type of cooking or fire lay that you create. So it's nice to have options. That's all I'm getting at. Select and store supply of natural materials for a fire. A lot of times I find those while I'm 
walking through trails and everything, but not always when I'm camping. Nope, sometimes I'm just walking around my local lake or through my own backwoods on my own property, and I notice some tinder and fire resources that I could easily pop into my haversack or my pocket and save for a later outing. Discuss and observe safety and conservation practices. For those of you that have kids, this is a great thing to do. Discuss those things with them. Also, when you're out there and you're doing those things, you want to observe that and discuss it with the people that you're with if you're going out there with somebody else. Um, so you're more aware and being on purpose with the conservation element of firecraft. Demonstrate an ability to light a fire with one paper match and one wooden kitchen match. You know, when I was teaching little Cub Scouts, and I still teach them from time to time, uh, camp craft and campfire and camp cooking with cast iron and all those things. I hold these big classes on my property for this stuff. Um, the only way I allow them to light a fire is with a wooden match or a paper match. Um, those little fingers on those little tiny kids sometimes can't flick the bick <laughs> um, or strike the ferro rod. Uh, we want them to get fire as quickly as possible. It's also a fun skill to teach them how to split a match so they can extend their resources throughout. And we'll talk about that more down the road. And finally, identify the fire triad. Probably a good idea for you to research that before you go out there. That's right. If you're watching this video, you have access to nearly all human knowledge that ever existed in the history of mankind. It's called the internet. You can find the information you can do your own research, you can take your own notes, and that's really important to do. Seek it out, not just from YouTube videos and things. You can read articles, you can look at different programs, you can buy certain books. And it's a good idea to continuously research these things in your own time. Toolcraft, one of my favorites, and we're gonna keep it simple for this one. Select an appropriate knife for camp and trail use. Um, over the years, I have gone through many, many knives. My current carry is the uh, PKS Scorpion HD in a leather sheath, and I like to carry my old uh, Swiss Army knife. <laughs> I've been carrying it for years, and I really haven't changed my pocket knife all that much. I do change my belt knives. I tend to carry a belt knife for camp and trail use, but I carry a pocket knife all the time, constantly. All right? um, that's your choice. Demonstrate ability to handle, care for, and store a pocket knife. That's really important. If your pants got loose pockets and when you bend down or sit down, your pocket knife always falls out of there, you need to find a way to secure that so that doesn't happen. If you do a lot of fishing or you buy water a lot, you might want to find a way to secure that to your belt or belt loop so you don't drop it into the water when you're using it. All right. Discuss and display knowledge of need for careful use of tools proper use of tools, local regulations turn concerning tool use and the carrying. I know some places don't allow you to carry belt knives. Some places don't allow you to uh, carry pocket knives or belt knives outside of your camp or work environment and things. You have to know that stuff for your area. Where I live in Pennsylvania, I can open carry a, a full belt knife, doesn't matter how big it is, on my belt. All the time, no matter what I'm doing, nobody can say anything about it. We're just not allowed to carry daggers and switchblade knives because those are considered weapons, right? Uh, demonstrate ability to sharpen, hone, and strop a knife. Most of the time I hone and strop my knife. I rarely ever sharpen my knives because I don't allow my blades to get to the point where they need sharpened. But it's important to learn those things. One thing I like to do, I like to challenge myself, and you can do this too, um, go to a local Goodwill or thrift store and find an old kitchen knife or an old pocket knife or an old hunting knife that's really dull and take that home and learn how to sharpen that thing. If it's got steel on it, you can likely get it back to an edge again. Demonstrate knife handling skills by making a tri-stick, displaying notches typically used in camp. A tri-stick is simply a stick and it's typically the length of from your fingertip down to your elbow and you carve notches in there that you would typically use around camp. If you don't know what notches to carve into a tri-stick, I want you to go to YouTube and look up Morse Kohansky tri-stick. He did a, before he passed away, he did an awesome video explaining the tri-stick and showing the notches that he likes to cut into the tri-stick. But tri-stick is for you to try notches that you're learning and that you're currently familiar with to keep your skills honed and to practice right? Um, what's nice is you can use almost any stick that's about 
the width of your thumb to do that. And it's a great way to whittle and practice with your knife. Learn safe knife handling, uh, learn how to control your knife, and it's a great thing to teach kids. So look up the tri-stick video and enjoy it. We're also going to be covering a tri-stick video in the Woodcraft League of America for all of our members. And when we launch our lodges and tribes, the tribes are going to be mentoring children and adults alike um, to do all the things that we've talked about so far. So let's move to the next section, which is rope craft. It is important to know various types of ro ropes used for camping and demonstrate their proper care. Uh, ropes can fall apart, they can rot, uh, they can deteriorate, they can get knotted up, they can get twisted. You want to take care of your ropes and you want to learn how to care for them properly. All right. It's also important to know that different types of rope made of different types of fibers are used for different types of things. So you need to identify different rope fiber, their uses, and know the strengths and weaknesses of each one. I love using natural rope and natural cordage and those types of things, but I also know that most of the time those natural ropes are gonna to tend to fray, rot, fall apart, may not be strong enough to do a lot of the things that I do around camp or when I'm hunting. So I need to know all these different types of cordages and ropes that I'm going to be using. No specialty terms used in rope work, like your lead, your tag, your loops, right? A bite. You need to learn the terminology. There is an app that I know about anybody can get. It's called Grog Knots, G-R-O-G-K-N-O-T-S, Grog Knots. It used to be called Animated Knots, and I think it is still called Animated Knots by Grog, okay? They literally, you click on any of the little thing, let's just say I go to uh, climbing on that app, or even scouting, let's go to scouting, and there's an adjustable grip hitch, alpine butterfly, black splice. It doesn't just show pictures of it. If I click on one of the little ropes, it shows me an animation of a real rope being tied in that way, in the way that I need it to, okay? There's also a little button on the bottom left when you click on each one of those types of hitches or knots or whatever it is and it'll flip it so you can see the left-handed or the right-handed version my son's left-handed he has a very difficult time tying things right-handed but i taught him all his rescue and safety knots to tie right-handed in case something happens to his left arm he only has his right arm to use right so it's really important to to learn those things but you got to know specialty terms used in rope work so you can explain it to others and so you can remember it for yourself and why we use that terminology. Also know the characteristics of a good knot. So with that, you want to demonstrate the ability to whip a rope end using two methods. Make a length of rope with two, three, and four ply construction. Trust me, that information is out there. You got to do your homework. Coil, throw, and care for a rope. Then identify two each of the following types of knots. Joining type of knot, stopper, loop, and end securing knots. Two of each of those and learn how to do them. People say, how much practice do you put into rope work, Bob? Well, I try to practice it until I can't do it wrong and then I continue to practice it at camp and different outings and when I'm tying things down on my truck and all kinds of things. It is a perishable skill. So learn it. Repeat it, practice it as much as, as you possibly can. And if you're going out there just to practice, what's nice about these types of things, you can go out in your backyard or on your back deck or even in your living room and take a hank of rope and start tying some knots. Um, tie and use a sheet bend, taut line hitch, bowlin, and overhand knots. The sheet bend, taut line hitch, bowlin or bowline, and overhand knots are four of the most important knots in sorry, and hitch that you can possibly um, learn. You'd use them a lot in camp settings and wilderness settings. So let's jump over to nature and conservation. Woodcraft isn't just about set pitching tents and sleeping under canvas tarps and sitting around the campfire and carving pointy things with pointy things. It's also about nature and conservation. The Woodcraft League is going to have a huge library of videos specifically focused on nature and conservation actually 
the Woodcraft League itself, the national organization, my organization that I own, is donating 10% of its profits every single year, half to youth programs and half to nature and conservation programs that we know where that money will be well spent. So with nature and conservation, you need to consider the effects of your outdoor living practices on the environment before you go, before you set up, while you're participating in camp activities, while you're tearing down and reflect upon it when you get home. Those things are important. If you didn't catch all that, go back a few seconds and write that down. Indicate good conservation practices in immediate camp or trip area, like on your hiking trails and where you're setting up your camp, maybe if you're canoeing along the shoreline, wherever it is that you're camping and tramping through the woods, right? Indicate violations of good conservation. Look around the camp area and the different trails and see if you see any violations of good conservation. If you can correct it easily while you're there, Great. If you need to reach out to somebody, call your park services or whoever runs that area and let them know about it. This, this next one's really important because this enacts something that's critical to the educational development within the Woodcraft League, and that's journaling. Get a journal. Get a nice journal. Get one that you could be proud of that'll fit in your pack. Okay. Make daily observations while you're out there and journal. I'm sorry. Make a daily observation journal of signs pertaining to weather geology, flora and fauna, and natural systems. We'll explain that more in the video tutorials I release in the members area. But right now, just realize journaling is a huge part. I know a lot of programs have a field guide or a handbook or something you take out there that says, do this, do this, do this, do this. No, we want you to observe. We want you to participate. We want you to use that noodle in between your ears called your brain. We want you to think through things. We want you to do research before you go out there. And we want you to be able to identify things by studying and practicing. I know that word study, but a lot of your study comes from your own journaling. It comes from self-reflection. It comes from just sitting your butt on the ground with your pack up against the tree, leaning back, going through your journal and writing about your experience and reflecting about that experience regularly. And then rereading that when you get home and thinking about or writing about what you could do better or what you noticed while you were out there. Did you notice any dangers? Did you notice that um, certain weather was rolling in or what certain weather has done to the area that you regularly camp in? These things are important. Next stop, gear and clothing. And I know I'm racing through this, folks, but like I said, in the members area, we're going to be releasing full-scale video tutorials and downloads of all of these things. It's an entire educational curriculum. This is just one of the programs that we're teaching. Um, gear and clothing. Demonstrate selection, packing, and carrying of personal gear suitable for locality, including clothing and sa safety items for one day or an overnight trip. What? What that means is you need to lay out your gear you need to pack your gear think about on purpose why you're selecting the particular gear that you're carrying then carry the gear <laughs> right practice carrying that gear go out on an outing go out on a nature walk near your home go walking down the sidewalk if you live in a city don't worry about it carry your gear carry your personal gear suitable for the locality that you're going to be going to to camp and this includes your clothing and safety items for one day or an overnight trip. Next, share in, if you're working with a group, share in selecting, packing, and carrying group gear for a day or overnight trip. Make an item of individual gear. One of the first pieces of gear I ever made was a haversack. Actually, one of the first pieces of items I ever made, I was probably about seven or eight years old, and I made a jawstring sack that I just... It had just two drawstrings on top. It was made of denim. It was reinforced in the bottom. I hand sewn that thing with double layers of fabric. And you pull the drawstring and I flip it over my back and use the drawstrings as my straps to, <laughs> to hold it on my shoulders. And I carried that thing for a long, long time. Um, but after that, I made a haversack, canvas haversack, because I, I needed that. Um, the big pack was for until I got to camp and I unloaded all my stuff and I set up my camp. Then I didn't really need the big pack. So I'd throw in my lighter haversack that had certain personal items or safety items that I wouldn't leave camp and go out on the trail on without. 
Um, make a list of all items, including cost and weight of each item. This is really important. Take inventory. Take stock of what you have and what you need. I like to create a camping checklist. Within the members area, we're going to be releasing an actual camp checklist um, template. You create a camp checklist of all the items that you believe that you need for your camping trip, covering all the different things that we've been talking about so far. Once you've completed that checklist of those items, now you need to, well, actually make sure you have those items laid out in front of you. Junk on a bunk type thing, right? Put it out on your bed, lay it all out, and get organized and check it off the items as you're st stowing them in your pack. Next, I think it's really important. You can sit online and do this, or you can go to your local grocery or camping supply store and write down the price, how much it costs to replace those items or the consumables or the food items that you have. Okay? So you know if you rip your sleeping bag really bad and it's just not repairable, which I've always found a way to repair everything, um, and you need to get another one, you have an idea of how much money you might need to save up or raise to be able to replace those items. Your consumables, if you're going to consume them, that means your fire starting stuff like matches, tinder quicks, whatever it is you may have. Um, it might mean lighters, it might mean ferro rods, it might be your pocket knife, your knife. How much would it cost to replace all these things? Consumables are the things that we consume. We use it up and it's gone and we have to replace it regularly. Then we have our regular uh, fixed cost items, meaning they they last us for a long, long time when we learn to take care of them properly. But things happen. Things get lost. Things get left behind. Things get broken. And you have to replace those things. You, you really want to know how much it would cost you to replace those items. Okay. Shelter and bedding. Don't worry. We're almost done. We only have a few sections left to cover. Um, select the best shelter and sleeping gear for one day or an overnight trip based upon type of weather, season, right? Um, your own comfort level. Like I like to be comfortable when I go camping. When I'm just out for a tramp in the woods and I decide I'm going to spend a couple days out there, a lot of times I'm backpacking it. I do. But many times I'm going out and it's just me or it's my son and me or it's my whole family or just me and my daughter. Um, even me, my wife and I have just gone by ourselves or together, I'm sorry. Um, there's different shelter and different sleeping gear that I need for different situations. The first time I ever took my wife camping uh, was about a year before we got married. And it was in October in Pennsylvania, in the middle of October. And we brought our food, we brought our tent, we had our sleeping stuff, and it was all well and good. And then it poured down the rain all night long, and the campsite that we were at was very hard. And all the rain kind of ran into the bottom of our tent soaked us really badly and then our cooler which sealed really tight got pried open by a raccoon and it ate all of our food and we had to go find more food for the weekend uh, let's just say we learned from that experience and i had been camping for a long long time things happen right so you need to put some thought into selecting the best shelter and sleeping gear for one day or overnight um, if you're going with a group Here's something that's fun to do. And I say do this yourself, even without a group. Share and setting up three types of trail tents or shelters without any fire needs, meaning you're not going to have a campfire. All right? So a lot of times I like to sleep with an open tarp configuration or a specialized tarp configuration that looks like an open face tent. Um, and it works great in the wintertime and in the fall with a fire in the spring. Uh, but in the summer, I don't have any fire be while I'm sleeping like that because I don't need it. I like the airflow coming through the cool air. Um, a lot of times I'll use a rain fly in a hammock. Um, I have hiking pole tents that uses my actually hiking poles as the tent poles for my tent. And that little tent folds up real small and just goes right into my backpack. Um, so you want to think about three types of trail tents or shelters without fire needs. Demonstrate care and use of sleeping gear. You know, one of the a really great practice, I think, for people to do, and I've done this for many things over the years, you know, you have that super computer in your, your pocket called a cell phone, and it's usually got a camera on it, usually as a video recording function. Video yourself setting up your gear. Demonstrate yourself caring for and using your sleeping gear. Demonstrate the knowledge of how to produce, conserve, and or relieve heat. 
discuss the importance of ground insulation systems, R value, those types of things. Research those things, study them. Record yourself doing these things and post it to YouTube. People are like, oh, I don't want everybody to see it. It, it, it. Trust me, it doesn't matter. Turn the comments off if you don't want people to comment on it or anything. But it's, a, it's an act of personal accountability and you get to listen to your own playback and watch what you're doing. And sometimes when we step back and we can see what we were doing, we can see what we missed or what we messed up or what we did really well right and we can take note of those things but when we're doing it and we're in it sometimes we're just too close to it and we're, we we can't see the obvious things that are going on that should or shouldn't be happening right campsite learn to locate a suitable site for the number of people camping that's one of the first things i teach young scouts is learning how to locate a suitable campsite learning the signs of uh, maybe where water would um, settle if there was a bad storm, um, any dips or, or rocks, um, any deadfall, right? We're looking for like wind, uh, widow makers, wildlife, and water, weather. Um, we wanna make sure that those W's are covered and we're not gonna get injured or uncomfortable in the middle of the night, right? Show good conservation and t safety techniques in the selection of a campsite. I've seen many people destroy a very nice wild area in the Pennsylvania game lands because they thought they found a nice place to set up a tent when they did. But in all actuality, they were destroying habitat and plant and fauna um, areas around wild areas that can't readily be replaced, right? And they were making a mess. Um, consider all the functions you'll need and set up a site to take best advantage. Um, you need to figure out what are the things that you will need to do to make that site um, functional and that will take advantage of the surroundings and the beauty and the comfort um, and while protecting those sites. And knowing that easy up, easy down, that's the way I camp. If it's easy to set up and it's easy to take down, if it's easy to unpack and it's easy to repack, then that's kind of setup I really wanna do for my campsites, right? Uh, next one is one that a lot of people ignore. Don't know why. I like to be healthy and I like to be safe. Sit down and learn or discuss with your family and friends simple health and safety practices in relation to outdoor living. You know, a friend of mine has a book group they meet, um, I think every weekend at a local Starbucks, there's about 12 of them. And they've decided that they're likely going to be starting a Woodcraft League tribe. Um, they have to contact me directly to do that. Um, and they're going to regularly once a month go on a camp outing. And one of their biggest discussions about that was, um, isn't it dangerous? Like, how do you clean yourself? So they need to learn things, right? But they've decided to attach a Woodcraft League tribe to their book group. That's their purpose. They love, they write books and they love to read and review books and discuss them with one another. They're book geeks like me, right? But they were concerned. And this is, this is part of this. You need to discuss with other people simple, simple health and safety practice in relation to outdoor living. Demonstrate a use of health and safety practices basic signaling, emergency signaling, or even just signaling to get your party's attention if you're far away from camp, and survival preparation and priorities. Outline principles to consider in human needs for food and water, especially if you're in a group, but you know, for yourself. Describe the benefits and health factors in personal cleanliness, and I'd say like, write, write notes, journal about it, right? and identify harmful plants and animals and no proper precautions for the areas you, you're gonna be traveling or camping in. Um, these things are extremely important. If you're doing it by yourself, you know, sit down and think about it to yourself, have a little me discussion. If you're doing it with a group, this is a great thing to talk about before you guys go on your outings and to keep in mind while you're out there. Um, let me tell you folks, think hygiene a lot. Um, you know, rashes in between your legs, blisters on your feet, um, you know, chafing under your armpits or in the crotch area, those types of things. Those typically happen because you're not as clean as you could be while you're out there. There's no reason why you need to go to the wilderness and look like you've been homeless when you come back. I come back 
clean, rested, groomed. My gear's packed nicely and easily unpackable and cleanable. I don't stress when I come home from a camping trip. I don't feel like I have a lot of work to do. And quite honestly, a lot of times I come home from a camping trip, I sit by my pool, put my feet up, and chill out with my family. I am relaxed when I come home, and I feel clean and refreshed and healthy. That's something you want to consider, okay? Navigation and travel. Demonstrate an ability to demonstrate it to yourself, to your group, with your group, with a friend, whatever it may be. Read a compass by giving bearings to designated objects. I use a Cento MC2 compass. To me, it's one of the best. A lot of survival schools use it as well. It's got a signaling mirror on it. It's got the movable bezel. It's adjustable for declination. I know how to use it forward and back, but if you don't know how to use one, it's a great first compass. They're not cheap, but they're not overly expensive, and it's great to have. Um, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, make sure you get a Northern Hemisphere compass if you don't get the global MC2 compass, okay? Um, read a compass by giving bearings to designated objects, meaning look in the distance and where that object is and figure out how to set a bearing to it. Uh, read up on navigation skills, okay? Reading a compass. Uh, find direction by sun and stars. I'm like, how am I going to do that, Bob? Learn which direction the sun comes up and it sets. Uh, <laughs> when it's in high in the sky or lower in the sky. Uh, learn what stars are in the sky. Learn a bit about, about astronomy and what direction those stars are in. Um, we've forgotten these core basic human skills of participating with nature, of being part of nature instead of just observing it all the time. You have to actually learn those things. In the Woodcraft League, we're going to be teaching many of those things, all of those things. Uh, for right now, go out on your own and learn how. It's one of the best ways to do it. Search the Internet. Learn about it. Learn navigating by the stars, navigating by sun, right? Give and follow simple directions using a sketch map, trail signs, or anything else that you feel that will help give directions or help you follow directions, okay? So there's many different things, like that old oak up on the hill with the big crotch in the middle and the broken branch on the right side as you're facing south. You know, that's that could be on your map, right? That could be in the directions that you, you've written up. Use a compass in a field project. It's one of the funnest things to do. Um, you can plan if you got kids or you got a group of kids, uh, even friends, I've done this with my friends too, up in um, Ohio Powell in the mountains in Pennsylvania, um, a scavenger hunt where I walk through and I write down the bearings of each location and I hit a, a certain object or a note that would lead to another clue. And then at the end, they each got a, a prize. It, it could have been anything like a, um, a, a you know, a, a big, you know, camping gear or basket or uh, some money or whatever and I hide it in a certain location and they use their compass in that field project with my directions to go out and uh, participate in a scavenger hunt and it's really fun to do with kids we used to do this all the time when we were kids my dad and my pap were big on uh, teaching us how to use compasses finally food hey I like to be fed when I'm out there I like to feel nourished I don't like to feel like I'm um, suffering from calorie loss while I'm out there. Plan, prepare, and pack balanced trail me meals that require no cooking. I tell you, I'm out on a trail. Last thing I want to do is fire up a little wood stove or my propane stove. or you know, I don't want to do I want to reach into my bag and eat. I want to be able to sit down and eat or just keep walking and eat. Um, so plan, prepare, and pack balanced trail meals requiring no cooking for the amount of time you believe you'll be on the trail and will require no cooked meals. Okay, prepare a well-balanced meal demonstrated three types of simple outdoor cooking. That could be frying, boiling, or cooking over a fire on a stick. Okay, <laughs> um, sharing setting up a trail kitchen for an overnighter or longer. That's first thing my son and I did when our last camping trip. Uh, we took a baker's tent. Well, it's the Woodcraft League Campfire Lodge baker's tent. It's a different size and made of sun forger material and we were testing it out first thing we did we unloaded the shelter set it up second thing we did we set up our trail kit or our camp kitchen why well because we like to eat we like to cook 
and we like to have everything readily accessible to not only cook and eat but to do our dishes and to dry them off and to stow them away and so we set up our own trail kitchen it's always the second thing we do when we get to a site share and planning a menu and food list for a two-day trip um, if you're doing it by yourself plan it yourself plan a menu and a food list for a two-day trip including dehydrated and easily packed foods dehydrated meaning just add water and heat foods maybe i'm just adding hot water to it and, or i'm adding it to boiling water um, you want something that's easy lightweight and you just have to add water to it consider the quantity of water needed in its sources meaning are there sources around for you to get clean water to consume and to cook with um, and to do dishes obviously right and is there enough water for your, your group or for you to have for the amount of days that you're going to be there to refill to hydrate yourself right well obviously it'd be a lot better if I was showing you how to do all these things but we're going to be doing that in the Woodcraft League members area um, there's going to be two different levels to the Woodcraft League really there's going to be the tribe level and that's an offline they're part of their own tribe part of a group and usually the tribe will be part of a lodge um, and I'll explain that down the road and but there's going to be an online membership that anybody can sign up for even if they're not a part of a tribe and they just want an individual one-time payment for a lifetime membership to access the curriculum right um, so I'm not leaving anybody out when it comes to this we spent a lot of years working on this and my family and I have put a lot of effort into it so I hope you enjoyed this presentation and can I just ask you no matter how experienced you are get out there and try out this first part of this master woodsman training because I think you'll have a lot of fun and I think it'll give you some purpose and some skills to hone and fine-tune and enhance upon and it's going to give you something you can do with your family your community your friends or even by yourself to enjoy the hobby of camping and woodcraft take care